much. And uh, good afternoon, folks. Uh, welcome, at least virtually, to Fort Worth, Texas. We're delighted that you're part of this Neighborhood USA conference and in particular part of our session this afternoon about uh, creating more equitable communities, Fort Worth Task Force on Race and Culture. I don't think I'll be saying anything controversial by commenting that almost exactly a year ago, the killing of George Floyd ignited calls for racial equity in communities across the country and around the world. And of course, Fort Worth, Texas was no exception, but I would say that we had had our own George Floyd moment, our own awakening to racial justice issues about three or four years before then, in December of 2016. So in a sense, we've had a three year head start on many other cities in addressing these issues. And so we hope that our experience in Fort Worth, what we've done right and what we might've been able to do better will be of some benefit to everyone in the session today. Now I see that we have among folks in the audience, Ms. Mitchell from Birmingham, Alabama. Ms. Mitchell, you all in Birmingham probably had about a 60 year head start on us. So forgive us uh, for being somewhat presumptuous. Uh, many of you have been involved in civil rights work over the course of many years and we would benefit from your questions and comments as well. I'd like to begin with a brief overview of our race and culture initiative. And then I'd like to pose some questions to our panelists. Uh, after which we would like to entertain questions from the audience. So if you have questions, please follow the instructions that Catherine gave us a few moments ago and post those questions in the question box and we'll be sure to do everything we can to address them. So I'm going to try to share with you a file with information about our race and culture initiative. And this should be showing up in just a moment. You should see the cover slide. Yes, sir. With the title of today's session. Thank you, Catherine. And you see the names of the folks who are serving on the panel. Besides myself, we have Councilmember Bivens, Ms. Biggins, Rabbi Bloom, Mr. Sanders, and Mr. Tucker, about whom a little more in due course. As I mentioned, it was December of 2016 when the news media around the world, and of course we live today at a time when news anywhere becomes news everywhere, almost instantaneously. Uh, headlines around the world uh, captured the drama in Fort Worth associated with what ordinarily might have been a routine request for police assistance and it turned into an overreaction and uh, calls for, for justice. Uh, and uh, these protests extended over a period of roughly six months, many late night city council meetings, eventually leading to the appointment of a task force on race and culture. In June of 2017, the Florida City Council held a special called meeting and announced its intent to appoint this task force with four co-chairs and authorizing those four co-chairs whom you see pictured on the screen to select the other members of the task force. The city council's intent was for this task force to be community-based and to have broad discretion 
uh, over uh, its charge to address issues of race and culture in our community. And in fact, the task force took that responsibility seriously and discharged it, I think, in an exemplary manner. Uh, the presiding co-chair was uh, Rosa Navajar, who could not join us today, uh, but we do have the other three co-chairs, Ms. Biggins, Rabbi Bloom, and Mr. Sanders. We also have Estros Tucker, who is our professional facilitator for the task force on racing culture, and of course, uh, uh, Council Member Bivens. Here's a picture of Estros Tucker and the logo for the National League of Cities. We also employed the resources of NLC, which has uh, its own uh, program uh, to promote uh, uh, racial equity. I would say that we were particularly blessed uh, to have had uh, Estrus Tucker uh, in support of our efforts. Uh, Mr. Tucker is a nationally, actually internationally respected expert on human relations. He just happens to have lived in Fort Worth and because Fort Worth is his hometown, he assigned priority to working with us on this effort. So we're particularly indebted to Estrus Tucker for his leadership of this effort. The city council adopted a resolution in August, formally creating the task force and giving it uh, some modest tasks, including that of conducting community conversations about race and culture, assessing disparities in the way that we provide municipal services and providing some uh, leadership training. Uh, but uh, the task force uh, determined uh, at an early stage that their mission should be much broader. Uh, and in fact, they went back to the city council and asked them to extend their deadline from August of 2018 to December of 2018 so that they have enough time uh, to complete its work. Here you see a listing of all the task force members, the four co-chairs plus 18 others who were serving at the time that the task force completed its work. The task force's mission was to listen, learn, build and bridge in order to create an inclusive Fort Worth for all residents with the vision that Fort Worth will become a city that is inclusive, equitable, respectful, communal and compassionate. We provided leadership training to city officials, but also to community leaders and interested residents. We had uh, many different public engagement opportunities, 89 different events, and involved some 2,100 participants uh, through those activities. And they identified various issues that we should be addressing. The top 10 included discrimination in education, failure to acknowledge the pervasiveness of racism, that this was largely an issue that we were not discussing, that we needed first of all to acknowledge it and then to explore it deeply discrimination in economic development in criminal justice, continuing racial segregation in the community, racial prejudice, lack of political representation, discrimination in public accommodations and employment and in housing. I'm sure that these are all familiar themes for many on this call. Some of the more salient comments that we heard more than once from Members of the public included the perception that the city is doing little or nothing to improve race relations, that the problem is really systemic, structural, and institutional racism, not simply personal or individual behavior. That again, we had failed to acknowledge the problem, causing the victims of racism to feel unheard. And finally, the need to continue to expand and deepen community conversations about race and culture. This is an ongoing effort, not a one and done kind of activity. The task force determined that we really needed to look at the full scope of quality of life issues in Fort Worth, how residents in different circumstances experience life in Fort Worth. If you live on one side of the railroad track, for, so to speak, you experience Fort Worth differently than if you live on the other side. And we need to understand that about each other. And so the task force decided that rather than looking 
exclusively at municipal services, they would look at all aspects of life in Fort Worth, including criminal justice, economic development, education, governance, health, housing, and transportation, and actually divided into committees to address these topics in considerable depth. They analyzed disparities with respect to each of these seven topics, the extent of the disparities, the causes of the disparities, and made recommendations for strategies, actions, potential challenges, responsible parties, and needed resources. And finally, we wanted to measure our progress. We wanted those measures to be specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time constrained. Where are we gonna be five years from now in reducing identified disparities with respect to all the topics that we addressed. So here is a matrix depicting the 22 race and culture strategies to address identified disparities. Each of the seven topics that you see listed on the left-hand column contains three or four strategies to address corresponding disparities. The highlighted items are the ones on which we've made the most progress so far creating independent oversight of our police department, establishing a police cadet program, expanding the capacity of our minority owned businesses through a new business equity ordinance, establishing criteria and procedures for redrawing our city council district boundaries so as to make it more feasible for folks to elect people who represent their interests, Establishing a new department of diversity and inclusion in city government, a new diversity inclusion program, and providing training for all of our 6,000 or so city employees in issues of diversity. And establishing a transportation equity policy and five-year action plan. We're now moving to establish a municipal equity plan that encompasses all municipal services. So these are the 22 strategies. We've made progress on seven of them to a significant degree, we're making progress on all of them to one degree or another. And we have a dashboard for tracking our progress with respect to each of the race and culture strategies. But as I mentioned, this is not a one and done kind of thing. We want to have an ongoing oversight group that ensures the work of the task force on race and culture continues into the future. And so we're calling upon our newly reconstituted Fort Worth Human Relations Commission to undertake that responsibility, and they've done so enthusiastically and vigorously. You see a, a picture on the screen of a demonstration in 1965 that led to the creation of the Human Relations Commission just two years afterwards. The Human Relations Commission has divided into the seven committees corresponding to the same seven committees that the Task Force on Race and Culture had established. And those committees are addressing uh, those uh, identified disparities and the strategies to address those disparities. They actually briefed our city council uh, earlier this week on the progress that they're making. We're, we're quite encouraged by the work of the Human Relations Commission along these lines. We're asking them to address the following questions. How much progress have we made in implementing those strategies? How should we accelerate that progress? How effective have the strategies and actions been in reducing racial and cultural disparities? Are we just taking action or are we actually moving the needle in respect to identified disparities? If necessary, if we're not moving the needle enough, how should we adjust our strategies and actions to achieve better results? How should we update our five-year objectives? And how should we engage community leaders and other residents in meaningful discussions about these issues? Here are the four main points I wanna make that may be of some value to other communities. The attributes of our process to eliminate disparities include a data-driven approach. We want the process to be driven by objective data, not merely by anecdotes. We wanna focus on outcomes, not just how much we're contributing to this effort in the way of resources, which is important, not just 
what products we're issuing, but what outcomes have we actually achieved in making Fort Worth a more equitable community with respect to the disparities we had identified. And some of those disparities are rather glaring. I wish we'd had time to give you more illustrations. We want this process to be informed by public participation. The public needs to be an active part of this effort. This is not something to be done by a small group uh, out of sight and out of mind. It's important for the public to be engaged. And finally, the city cannot do it alone. We need partnerships with many different community groups. This is a community-wide issue, not a city government issue. And we need to approach it with that idea in mind. So let me turn our conversation over now to our uh, distinguished uh, panelists. Uh, pictured from left to right, you have Councilman Regina Bivens, uh, who has had a, a long uh, career in uh, uh, many different aspects of uh, uh, community relations uh, uh, and communications, uh, including her, her current work uh, as uh, Chief Executive Officer for uh, North Texas LEAD, an organization that promotes uh, career opportunities for underrepresented uh, minority groups. Uh, next, we have uh, Ms. Lily Biggins, uh, who has uh, allegedly retired uh, recently from a long and successful career in healthcare administration as an executive with Texas Health uh, resources. We welcome Ms. Biggins. Rabbi Andrew Bloom, uh, one of the uh, foremost uh, spiritual leaders in our community and active in a wide range of uh, civic affairs. Uh, Bob Ray Sanders, uh, uh, some would say a, a legendary figure in our community uh, as uh, an executive uh, with uh, the Forest Star Telegram newspaper and other uh, popular media, but I think better known for being a kind of conscience of the community, uh, one who is not afraid to say that, which may not be popular at the moment, but which needs to be said. Uh, we welcome uh, Mr. Sanders. And uh, I uh, introduced uh, Estrus Tucker earlier, uh, our uh, esteemed uh, uh, facilitator of difficult conversations uh, about uh, race and culture. So uh, with that introduction, let me stop sharing and uh, pose some questions and uh, uh, let's see if we can begin with the jump ball. Uh, let me ask any of the five who wishes to jump in to respond to the following. Why why did you agree four years ago to play a leadership role in a race and cultural initiative? What were your expectations at that time? And to what extent has the initiative met your expectations? If you'll just need to unmute yourself if you want to be the first one to speak. And if I've never known this group to be basketball, let, uh, let me say, uh, Rabbi. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I always need to talk before Bob Ray because, uh, you know, it just uh, it's uh, it's been that way for four years. So uh, that's uh, that's why I'll take the first one. You know, for me, it was a great honor. I'll tell you, um, before this, uh, the task force for race and culture began, I had been serving on the mayor's faith based cabinet on compassionate Fort Worth. So it's all sort of like a natural progression. And. To me, each morning when we say our uh, morning prayers uh, in, in synagogues and around the world, one of the first prayers we say is, uh, we thank God for making uh, me in his image. And it doesn't say made me a Caucasian in his image or an African-American in his image or Hispanic in his image or, or straight in his image or LGBTQ in his image. It says in his image. So to me, uh, ensuring that each person's image is seen not only by God, but by each other is essential to my daily life and essential to my communal life. So when I was asked to do it, the answer was, 
of course. When Maddie Parker called, it was, uh, you know, of course I would um, uh, do it. I think the process itself was a great process because we all got to meet and understand different aspects of the communities that we may not have known and thereby bring them together in order to help a uh, uh, make a better fabric of the city. And uh, I'm sure uh, Bob Ray and Lily uh, and Fernando, you remember this. When we walked into the first meeting to uh, meet each other, I said, I hope this is uh, communal, not political. And they laughed at me. Uh, but I think in the end, it was very communal and not that political. Uh, because we made a decision in the beginning that uh, we were going to drive this. We weren't going to allow outside influences to drive it. And I think it's been a good thing. Have we gotten everywhere we need to go? Absolutely not. But uh, a, a, um, a uh, walk of a million miles of a thousand miles starts with one baby step. And we started and we've continued to going. So I think we're, we're a better, more compassionate city. But I think we have uh, more to go, and I'm I'm honored that I've been part of this little step moving forward. Bob Ray. Yes, well, as been suggested, I, I was probably the most cynical of those people who were appointed uh, as co-chairs. Uh, in fact, uh, it had to be a little arm twisting by the mayor and the city manager and Fernando, I'll say, uh, for me to agree because. I was skeptical. I've seen groups before, commissions and task force and committees uh, work for a year or several months and come up with a report. It gets filed and nothing else is done. And I wanted to make sure that if we were going to do some serious work and if I was going to devote my time to it along with everybody else, that what we did would actually be recognized by the city council as something that was important and would be dealt with. And I was assured of that by all of the people that I talked to. I, and, and my statement was with the warning, hey, if I find out we start doing this and it's just for show, I'm going to be out again. Well, as it turned out, it wasn't just for show. Uh, we sometimes got signals that what we may be considering in terms of recommendations may not ever get done, maybe dead on arrival, that kind of thing. But we as, as a group decided that if it's dead on arrival, it won't be because we killed it. It'll be because somebody else aborted it, not us. And uh, and to be honest, I, I am more than pleased with the progress we made so far. The fact that we have a police monitor, the fact that we have a director of diversity and inclusion already on board, those two things alone moved us forward. And I'll just say this, I mean, in, in terms of George Floyd, uh, this city, we, we had demonstrations for several weeks. I mean, three and four a day every week in Fort Worth for George Floyd. Our demonstrations were peaceful. Uh, they, 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 they brought together a group that I didn't expect to see in Fort Worth. I mean, a, a lot of young people involved, a, a lot of young Anglos involved. And I think because we had already gone through this process with the task force, we didn't have the violence that happened in many other cities because we, had, we were already a step ahead. Uh, as it turned out, uh, our deputy police chief was a liaison uh, with our group. He heard everything that we heard. So a lot of the things that were being implemented, uh, he was already on board with. Uh, Fernando, I mean, the whole city manager's office, they knew what we were doing and helped facilitate where we should go in terms of dealing with the city council. So I, I, I'm pleased, yes, there's, I, I will die unsatisfied. You got to understand that. I mean, I, I realized that about 50 years ago. I won't live to see everything that I want to see done in Fort Worth, uh, but I'll die a little more satisfied than I would have, say, five or six years ago. Miss Lilly? Thank you, Mother. Just need I to unmute need to yourself. You. <laughs> Sorry. Unmute, Lily. You're still muted, Lily. Lily, Lily, I'm you. It's 
still on mute. Let me try to do it if you don't, just don't touch it. Hold on one second. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Kathy. It will not let me what? unmute you, ma'am. I'm sorry. We, we still can't, yeah, we cannot hear you. It's not letting me unmute you. I'm sorry, it's not, um, it's something on your end that I can't fix. Can she, can she press the mute, where the mute, the microphone if, is, if she presses there. Yes, that's all she needs disappear. to do. No, she just needs to push where it says mute on your screen, the little bot, the button, if you'll just push that down and it will unmute you. Unmute. You see yes. the unmute, Billy? Yes, she's she's done several of them. Is there a number she can have to call in on? Because she's done no. several virtual. No, that we don't have a phone number for this. Okay. It's not one of those. It's just an unmute. Oh, this is a shame. Yeah. Miss Lily, you can use the chat function if you want to and type in uh, anything that you want to say there. I'm so sorry. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm going to call let's, let's keep working on it. Let's keep working on it and see if we can come back to, to Ms. Biggins. And, but but uh, uh, while, while, while you, she's doing that, right. and doing that, I want to say that Lily was the person who insisted that everything we did had to be driven by data. She would ask for that. And as it turned out, to my surprise even, the city of Fort Worth, all the data we needed, the city of Fort Worth basically had. Yes, we had you know the National League of Cities and all of those people. But the city of Fort Worth had data that I didn't even know we had uh, that substantiated a lot of the disparities that we were looking at. But Lily was one who, in every meeting, said, "What's the data? We've got to have the data." So I thank her for that. Thank you, Bob Ray. Uh, we are we are thrilled to have uh, Estrus Tucker uh, connecting with us, uh, Estrus. Can, can you hear us? Estrus Tucker, can you can you hear me? Maybe not. Estrus, can you hear us? I can only. I, I, can, I can hear you. I, I heard you just then, and I heard okay. Gina earlier. Other than that, I haven't heard anything. No questions. So I don't really know where we are. I just okay, so heard your voice. The question is, Estrus, uh, what what was it that made you uh, want to be a part of the, the – how did you feel about being a part of the Race and Culture Task Force? And why um, did you want to accept that? Uh, the, the briefest response is that Fort Worth is home. Uh, I'm a native Fort Worthian, um, uh, and, and home is, is like family uh, for me. So – I, I do diversity, equity, and inclusion work around the country and some places beyond this country. The opportunity to engage a diversity of leaders to advance equity and, and inclusion and diversity in my hometown uh, was powerfully compelling and continues to be. And I also think of uh, James Baldwin when he's talking about his own racial equity work back when I think I was a year old and Baldwin was asked about, about his voice in, uh, in America. And he simply says, I love America more than any other country in this world. And exactly for this reason, I insist on the right to criticize America perpetually. And though my role wasn't about criticizing perpetually, but it was about bringing a critical eye to these issues in Fort Worth. And because Fort Worth is home and because I love it, I feel that it's imperative that I do my part to advance equity and inclusion to help us be better together than what we've been historically and what, what we were in 2017 when we started this and, and even where we are now. There's so much work to do that requires all of us and that was powerfully compelling to me. Thank you. Thank Esther. you, Esther. Uh, let's, uh, let's see if Councilman Bivens wants to uh, yeah. add any observations at this stage. Yeah, I, I thought it was appropriate that I go last. I did talk with Lily and you know, she's going to hang in there just to see. But Lily has done many virtual meetings all the time, so she knows where that little mic is. I think there's there's something technical. But uh, uh, Fernando works with me and has worked with me long enough to know that I'm always going to be the person uh, being painfully realistic. And so pardon me if I don't have a, a rah-rah response for you. 
uh, I will be the first to let you all know I was not excited about a task force like this being formed because I didn't need a task force to let me know that there was a race problem in Fort Worth. And, and that, that was my position. I saw it kicking the can down the road. And again, this is my realistic response to that question. Uh, when, when it comes to no violence in Fort Worth, Bob Ray, uh, I love you dearly, but once you use tear gas, I think we had violence. Now, the difference about Fort Worth is when we had the tear gas go off, people in Fort Worth knew who some of those people were. So we had, back in the days, the Black Panthers used the term agent provocateurs. We had many people who came to Fort Worth because they wanted to see this city burn. And when police spotted our protesters, the Fort Worth natives, they told them, get off the bridge, go home, and they did. But tear gas was used. And so for, for, for practical purposes, it didn't go across completely nonviolent. I, I will tell you that there are people in this city still today who don't know some of the challenges we had in giving the public what they wanted. Every week, we had what I call a verbal beatdown because people were telling the audience on cable TV, they can fire the chief right now. And I know you all remember that. Uh, too often, what people see and perceive is not reality. That demand, that, that criticism came from people who did not understand the council manager form of government. Now, what I can tell you is I am delighted. Please excuse me while my repairman waits for me. Do not leave, I will be there shortly. I've had no internet all day. I will be out there shortly. What, what, what has come from this process that is good for me is to see the, the data that Liddy pushed for, is to see those things that we can measure that we brag about all throughout this United States. I, I hate that it took the Jacqueline Craig situation to bring that about, but it is what it is as, as the saying goes, but just know that I was not one in full support of this being formed. So you can evict me from the conference at this very minute if you choose, and I'll go on about my day or else I'll just hang around. You're good, counsel. You're, you're good. <laughs> Fernando, we have a couple of papers. questions. Yes. Fernando, we have a couple of questions that do you want me to read those out or do you want to finish your uh, question? Yeah, uh, read the questions. Uh, okay. Any, so, of us, any of us can respond. What is the racial makeup of your police department? This is coming from Ian Randolph. What percentage of the police officers live outside the Fort Worth area? Do you think any of the above statistics impact policing in your city? Anybody want to take a stab at, at that question? Well, I, mean, I don't know what the, uh, what the percentages are. We, we have those in our report, the makeup of police and including uh, the makeup of the uh, incoming cadets of which was very underrepresented uh, for minorities. And in, in, in terms, I can tell you in terms, and Fernando, you probably know this better than I do, in terms of people who live outside the city, the vast majority of our police officers do not live in the city of Fort Worth. They live outside the Fort, not only outside the Fort Worth, they live outside the county. And that's true of most major cities in Texas and probably around, around the country. Uh, but one of the things we said, but we, we had to do, we had not been doing recruiting the way I thought we should be doing recruiting before. And I, I think that's one of the things that came out of our discussions so that we would get more minorities. We've had classes where we had no blacks at all. We may have had a couple of Hispanics, but no blacks at all. And, uh, and Gina may know those figures better than I, uh, but no, that, that, that was a problem. And, and that was one of the things that the police monitor was supposed to do not only look at the external issues involving the police department, but look internally at some of the issues that we needed to be addressing. And, 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 and representation of minorities was one of those issues. I, I can add on, keep in mind, I didn't hear everything, but you're talking recruitment. Uh, we, we have to give hats off to Julie Swearingen, who has all but held the hands of recruits. We had a class I think two classes ago where we had three, but another police related incident took place, not even here in Fort Worth, and we lost two. And that class had one African-American. That was the last graduation I went to. 
Uh, I remember the days back in probably the 80s when we did a lot of advertising on KHVN. And Barbara, that's when Elrita and, and Dee would come on the radio and say, we want you to join. Yeah, that doesn't KHVN happen. Was basically a black radio station, gospel station. Yes. And, and the it, it's very difficult to get civilians to cross that blue line when they don't see trust coming across that blue line. And so we continue to struggle. Uh, Councilwoman Kelly Allen Gray and I have offered our services and both done videos encouraging recruitment. And so you know, we, we continue to offer our support in that area, but it, it's really not the career of choice for many people of color. Good observations. Anybody want to add anything? I think it's fair to say that uh, minorities, particularly African Americans, have been underrepresented in the police department generally and, and almost totally unrepresented in many of the specialty units of the police department. And we had a lot of work to do uh, to, uh, to make the police department itself uh, more closely reflect uh, the community that it seeks to serve. Uh, and we're making progress, but uh, not as rapidly as any of us would like. Uh, let me see, uh, we can answer, here's a related question. How do you assess the progress of the task force's work in the wake of uh, Tatiana Jefferson's uh, killing, uh, which occurred in October of 2019? Uh, what impact did that event have upon our efforts? Anybody want to take a stab at it? The uh, Tatiana Jefferson incident. I, I hate to do all the talking, but I, I, I can say this. Um, we, we had five shootings, police involved shootings in five weeks. Uh, what, what, two years ago, three years ago, the Tatiana, the Tatiana Jefferson was one of the most horrendous because she was a woman in her home, unarmed. Somebody had called the police to come check on her because her front door or something was open. And the police went to the back, saw her silhouette in the window and shot. Uh, so that hurt. But what that did do in a way and, and I thank God for this. I mean, we, we had a new police chief by then who had been with our task force as a liaison. Uh, I can tell you for a fact that because I was involved in this, uh, the police chief, the mayor, the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 well, and one other person, the uh, city manager, met with that family at, at a private home. And I was there. And we asked the family if it would be okay if those people would also attend the funeral. So we had we had a group of police officers, in addition to the mayor, the council, and several other city council members who attended the funeral of Atana Jefferson. That showed the community that we were trying to make some progress, even if we weren't. So to me, I mean, to be there and witness that made me feel better. I, and I think it made some other people of the community feel better as well. Fernando, oh, yes, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I have to be measured you know, in my responses because of you know, legalities now. Uh, but Ray Charles can see that there are two areas of employment that that shooting sparked. Number one, training. Number number two, training. Number three, training. My AT&T repairman who just left here was so concerned about the issues of the day, and this is an Anglo from New Orleans. He talked about the mission of police that being to protect and serve uh, versus the mentality of military personnel, which is to kill or be killed. I had never thought about it in that vein. Now, back, uh, I refer a lot to the 80s because the 80s for me were, were quite 
uh, impressionable. Uh, that's when we had John Wally Price, Mary Helen Itz speak out, a whole bunch of uh, advocacy journalism talk shows all across this nation. That was new to me being a formally trained journalist where you do one side and, and the other side. But what, what I can tell you is when you look at the training capacity of those who we train, but those others who come in with additional training, the AT&T repairman made me think, you know, what, what if we take note of how we retrain those from military backgrounds, bringing them into this civilian form of life of protecting and serving, maybe outcomes can be better. But, you know, the, the, the shooting of a Tatiana Jefferson is something that we will bear as a city, as we should. We should do right by that family. But we also need to take measures that keep that from ever happening again. And in addition to training, uh, the, the idea of knowing what's in a cop's jacket, what's in that personnel, that HR folder, has this officer had trouble elsewhere? Has he had trouble here? And so I, I think personnel, training, those are factors that spark for me about a Tatiana Jefferson. I can't deal with the death emotionally. I have to see what can I do as an elected official to keep this from happening again. And so thanks to my repairman today, that is something I'll be taking up with Jay Choppa later on this week, hopefully tomorrow, to talk about that military aspect. Because back in the 80s, I, I, I digress, back in the 80s, the uh, so I think it's the SPLC, Southern Poverty Law Journal, Morris Deese's organization, uh, did reports on how there was this call, and Estrus will remember, there was this, this military call nationwide urging white supremacists to join police departments all across the nation. That has recently made news in, in the past three or four years, but this happened and we all know it for those who follow social justice issues. And so since they heeded that call and they are members of police forces around this entire nation, it at least lets city staff, county staff take, take note. Maybe we need to do some deeper training and debriefing. And so my hat goes off to my AT&T repairman Estrus, thank you for nodding an agreement. I know I'm not crazy, and I know they did that back in the 80s. Well, there's a, a, a rabbi, Rabbi Bloom, and then yeah. we'll go up to the next question. I, I just want to make a, a, a general comment. You know, I don't want to um, look at the ne necessarily the neg negative just for one thing, and one thing I want to mention. When we were doing the task force, and, and Lily and Bob Ray and Rosa can attest to this, we kept coming up with almost hitting our heads in the wall with the uh, police uh, chief at that time. I think what has happened with the last two chiefs, Ed Krause and Neil Noakes, uh, the uh, current chief, is that they learned, first of all, I think they have servants' hearts. That's the first and foremost, the most important thing. Uh, I, I think they learned the importance of showing that servant's heart in the entirety of the community and not being the chief from an office, but being the chief with the chief's feet out in the neighborhoods. And I don't think that necessarily would have happened had the task force not come up and had the city not dealt with such issues. So yes, there's all these issues that we see, we see but there's no longer a denial from the top of what's going on. There's actually an embracing of the need to change and the need to be out in the community. So uh, to me, those are two of the greatest things that we could have done, that there's a, re a, a recognition from the chiefs of what needs to be for the betterment of the community, that they have that servant's heart and that they're actually following that servant's heart in being within the community. So I think that's something very positive that came out of this within the police force. Thank you, Rabbi. Uh, there's, a, there's a related question uh, in the box from Steve Epstein, who's one of our neighborhood leaders in Fort Worth. A Fort Worth neighborhood policing officer said he did not want to live inside the city of Fort Worth because he does not want his family or himself to be a target or upset people he has interacted with. Is this a common problem? And there is a, a comment, by the way, a related comment in the chat box 
uh, from uh, uh, Mr. Randolph in uh, Memphis, who says that Memphis, Tennessee passed a law that says our officers have to live inside our county and preferably inside the city. Now that's in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, I will tell you that uh, state law in Texas prohibits us from doing that. Right. Uh, we cannot legally require any city employee and certainly not any police officer to live in the city of Fort Worth. Uh, and uh, uh, and so uh, I think uh, uh, Mr. Randolph makes an important point. Uh, and uh, many of us would want us to be able to do what Memphis has done, but in uh, Texas, we're not legally permitted to do so. Would anybody like to respond to the question uh, from uh, uh, Mr. Epstein uh, about... Uh, Yes. Yes, I'll, I'll give you just a little addendum to that, because when I was a city department head in San Antonio, as an appointed official by the city manager, I did have a residency requirement. And so so that people won't get confused, there is a difference in being appointed. I didn't have to take the job. But if I were to take the job as that city's public information manager, I had to live within the city limits. We had the uh, the same criticism of police in San Antonio. And it's statewide because of the law, as you described. But I thought I would just add that for clarity. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, also, we have in it had instances where we try, had chiefs who tried to encourage people to live in the city. Uh, either the, if, if they could take their cars home with them. And that was, that was a twofold thing. First of all, they had transportation. They didn't have to drive their own cars back and forth. Uh, but having a police car in a neighborhood overnight led to some kind of assurance that, hey, there, you've got protection here. But still, you, you, I know we can't we can't make them do that. Uh, and it's sad. But to hear that, that 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 first question was really disturbing to me because you've got a police officer saying he thought he would have to interact with the people who may not like him because he's a police officer or whatever. Uh, that's the opposite of what we want in, in, in a person wearing that uniform. We want them to interact, but positively, not negatively. We want them to get to know those kids in that neighborhood, those elders in that neighborhood, and not be afraid of them. That's part of the problem with some police. They come into our community already afraid. It's like the people from Johannesburg coming into Soweto. We, we don't want that kind of attitude. And we have a related uh, comment uh, in the chat box. Actually, it's in the question box. It's more of a rhetorical question from Adrian Pearson from Birmingham, Alabama. If that is the case, and the police officer does not want to live where he works, then why work there? I think many of us uh, would uh, would agree with you, Ms. Pearson. Yes, why sir. do you want to work for the city of Fort Worth if you're not willing to live in the city of Fort Worth? Uh, so, uh, good point. Uh, there's another question uh, from Tina Shaw. How did you get access to that data? And is it open to the public? Uh, yes, all of our data is open to the public. Uh, and uh, we derive data from uh, multiple sources, wherever the expertise uh, happened to be uh, located. Uh, and the whole effort, as we mentioned earlier, was driven by objective data. Uh, I think stories, uh, can help us to understand the data better, uh, but stories uh, alone are not enough. Uh, we need to have uh, hard evidence. Uh, in fact, hard evidence is the only way in which we can persuade a lot of folks about the reality that uh, many experience every day. Uh, it's simply not uh, something that people are prepared to accept unless you can confront them with hard objective data. Hence the the reliance upon the data in all of our work. Okay, well let me uh, let me see if, uh, if we've answered the questions that are in the box at the moment. Let me pose the next question that I wanted to be sure that we uh, address. Uh, what advice would you give to other communities that are interested in tackling racial equity issues based on our experience in Fort Worth? Well, we did right. Well, we could have done better if uh, 
if someone from another community were to approach us and say, we'd like to undertake another, a similar effort to promote racial equity, what advice would you give them? Estrus Tucker, you've done this kind of work in, uh, in South Africa, in Northern Ireland, uh, in Mississippi, and who knows how many other places. What advice would you give them, Estrus? Well, first of all, Estrus, can you even hear us? Estrus, what advice would you give to other cities who want are interested in doing this type of work? Uh, okay. Uh, one, don't seek perfection. Um, two, engage uh, and involve early uh, a very diverse stakeholder group. Uh, don't be limited to what we call the usual suspects. Uh, don't avoid engaging those who are critical of the city. Uh, in fact, they are essential. Their voices are essential for any viable, sustainable plan. Uh, and never assume that because a resident is critical of the city as it relates to diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, that, they are, that they can't be of value that they don't have goodwill, that they don't care about the city. None of those things are true. So find people of goodwill who have a critical eye and, and particularly a critical eye because of historical and current disparities and inequities and never allow uh, the void of not including people most impacted by disparities and inequities. They should be at every table and not just because someone has the same race or same surname or same language, select vocal people from the particular communities impacted by the disparities and inequities. Those are critical. It's harder work on the front end, but it buys you leverage as you go along. It helps you uh, demonstrate that you're sincere and that you're real. It's a more lengthy process. It can have more conflict, but it is more viable and more credible. So we, you need all of your people that are willing to roll up their sleeves and engage and not just limited to people that you feel will agree with you or will have predictable um, messages. That's a sure way of just wasting everybody's time. Thank you, Estrus. And uh, my advice if you're interested in undertaking this kind of effort, is to hire Estrus Tucker as your facilitator. Again, Estrus didn't hear me, but everybody else did. So that's my advice. And I'm happy to see that Lily Biggins is back with us. Ms. Biggins, can you, can you speak? You're still muted. What a shame. Brett, I had racist there. Can can you hear us now, Ms. Lily? I can hear you. I've always Yay! Heard you. Okay, perfect. So, there you so go. Just so you know, just so you know, it, in, the, in response to that last question, I'd say don't give up. Don't give up. Because I so desperately wanted to be a part of this event that I went to my cell phone. So that's where I'm talking, <laughs> where I'm talking about. Uh, well, the, the community was, was really hurting about the time that this happened. And, and I'll just go back just a little bit to state my, my um, impressions of being asked. One of the things that made me want to be involved in this was because of all the pain. And it wasn't just pain from one person or the other, much like with uh, Mr. Floyd. People saw that all over the world, and so no one could hide from what they saw. And and people saw the... the uh, they saw that all over the world so you couldn't hide. So people were hurting in a different way, a collective way, where it was all of us, not just black, white, brown. It was all of us that were hurting. And, and the one question I asked uh, Fernando when he gave me the call was not only who wanted me to be a part of this, but who didn't want me to be a part of it. Fernando, you may remember that because you have to know, not that it was my mind as to whether I would participate, but what it would do is it would let me know who had an issue so I could address that issue with them and become 
their representative as well as the other people's representative. Uh, when it comes to um, how would we go about this, it's already been mentioned that you have to collect data because data trumps anything else. And I think our group did an, an outstanding job of collecting data. The city council, I would agree with Councilwoman Bivens. I don't think we had all the support we needed. I think some people thought we would uh, quiet it down and, and keep people out of city council meetings if they appointed us. And, and it did happen that way. But, but at the end of the day, I think our energy and our commitment, city council, all of the members, not just the ones who were for the task force formation, but the ones who may have come in half-heartedly, I think it let them know that we were serious and you, they had to get on board. And, uh, and I think it's just a matter of caring enough, listening from the heart and being kind, being kind to each other and, and, be, and showing empathy that got us a lot of the traction. I can't add anything that's already been said about the progress being made. Uh, I will say though that have people sitting in the horseshoe who aren't bought in and I think those individuals, it's time for them to step up and buy in. Uh, the time that we had extension was needed because we were so heartfelt about all of this and had so much support from the community. Uh, and and I, would, I would be remiss if I didn't go back to the posting on the internet. Create a communication tool so everyone has the opportunity to see the progress and monitor it so they know something's being done so IT created this uh, this program. I wanted to know what happened in the last meeting. You could go to your computer, look it up, and see what was discussed and what the outputs were. So congratulations to all of you who are uh, on this uh, conference with us. Apologize for having such a difficult time with my audio, but you know what? This is a whole new arena for us. And uh, we'll we just we have to stay committed and make sure that we are focused and make it happen. So thank you for the opportunity to com comment. Thank you, Ms. Biggins, for your comments and and for your ability to negotiate the technology <laughs> and, and join us uh, despite despite the, the the problems. I love you, call on Rabbi Bloom uh, yeah. to share with us his his advice for other communities who are interested in tackling similar issues. Rabbi? Yes, thank you very much. And it, it's it's great that Lily was uh, able to get on. I, I think one thing we need to mention, even before I give advice, or it's part, part, uh, part of the advice, there was four of us. And no matter how we argued uh, or debated or voted uh, within the room when we were, try were tackling issues, once we left that room, we left it completely united as one. Because if we hadn't left united, we would have shown already cracks within us, which would have affected the cracks within society, and we would not have been able to get where we needed to go. We all understood that we were serving a greater good than our own selves. And I think that's very, very important. I think when we're talking about race and culture, we need to understand that if someone is embracing such a task, sometimes we get down the pigeonhole of dealing more with the race and not with the culture. And I think we needed to expand that because when you talk about culture, you're not only talking about how someone looks, but what religion they may be, uh, where they were brought up. So I really think you need to put emphasis on both of them or otherwise you're not fulfilling your, uh, your goal. And the third thing I would say is, you know, don't be afraid to take people newer to the city and who haven't grown up in the city. One of the things which was, I think it may have uh, given, uh, I actually think it gave Councilwoman uh, Bivens a, 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 a second thought, which is, terrific because she cares so much about the city is I was, I didn't grow up in Fort Worth. I was new six years. I had been in Fort Worth at this point, but all my experience and my love of Fort Worth, which is deep and the, the community, which is deep helped me bring another perspective to, to this. So I would say, don't only take the people who have been in your city, 
or grown up in your city, right. Right. but widen it because that that's already showing that the culture of the city is growing. Listen, there, there are bumps along the way, but it, it, I would suggest to anyone who's undertaking this to undertake it and to undertake it in a way to know that the work is difficult, but the outcome is blessed. And if I just might add one other thing, I, I'm sorry. Uh, Go I, ahead, Ms. Dickens. If I could just add one other thing. There are community leaders who are community advocates all over the place, just like leadership. Leadership, uh, you know, people talk about being an effective leader. The one thing I learned and, and had driven home to me with this, with this particular effort was how do you was how to get other people's perspective on what's going on. Because if you, if you are really an uncommon uh, community advocate and you really are invited to the table to be a part of a solution, you can't take the baggage that you have into that conversation. You have to take in uh, into the conversation a willingness to be uncommonly open, uncommonly willing to to hear what others are thinking because this is a very diverse community and people live in very different situations. You have to hear people from your heart. And that's the thing I think that made this work is that we were uncommonly willing to hear and, and to speak on behalf of those who were speaking from their hearts and then take their, per their perception of what's going on and, and bring legs and life to it so people could understand and hear from their hearts. So I think that's something you have to do. Put away all the old stuff, come in with some new things and, and be willing to be, criti be criticized. Thank you, Ms. Figgins. Let me, let me ask. Uh, you left mine uh, out, uh, Fernando. No, no, actually I want to ask you and Bob Ray a more pointed question uh, because I want the two of you to comment about the dynamics between the elected officials and the widely recognized community leaders at the grassroots. Uh, I think there are some who would say uh, that the elected officials uh, have other forces that influence their decisions. Uh, and find it difficult to support all of the recommendations coming from a grassroots uh, task force. Others would say, no, that's not the case at all. The elected officials come from the community and they're responsive to the community. I, I want uh, to see whether Ms. Bivens and Mr. Sanders uh, are willing to comment on the interactions between the task force and the city council. Ms. Bivens. Well, from the very beginning, I thought the city council had messed this up enough and it was my position never to attend any of the meetings. And I did that respectfully. I later learned that the task force thought that was a pretty good idea too. But I thought that the task force needed to operate within its own realm without us you know, peering from, from the ceiling, if you would. So I never attended a meeting. Uh, I will tell you that if you, there, there are, if I'll just get the elephant out of the room, uh, subpoena power, civilian review, subpoena power. Uh, I mentioned the name Hector Santos Rodriguez and uh, Bob Ray knows that name. That was the young teenager in Dallas who was killed. And not until I mentioned that, did I hear from the Hispanic community here in Fort Worth. I guess those who approached me didn't know that, you know, we read papers, but I was a reporter in Dallas at the time. Uh, that's a sticking point. And there are people who have criticized us on the city council for our lack of unity, I'll put it that way, in recognizing what, what should be addressed. Uh, mm -hmm. I did commend our police chief yesterday or, or Tuesday in council meeting. He is progressive thinking. And I, I don't know how long it will take, but I do know that he has not shut the door on that. I am not stating in this body whether I'm for or against, but I just know that when you deal with police matters and they're not handled to, to bring about peace, that subpoena power comes into play. 
And so you can talk to Chief Noakes to see what his thoughts are, the previous chief. And the uh, I think the chief of most chiefs this day and time are being more supportive of that than I have ever heard in my life as a journalist. So I'll answer that question that way. I hope that's not too wishy-washy. Uh, exactly. what, what I would like to do, though, is back up on how to do this, Fernando. And to this task force's defense, the time we introduced the task force to NLC's REAL, the uh, National League of Cities REAL program, they didn't have the data that you guys were needing to, to proceed in the professional way that you did. But I would submit to any city who wants to take on an effort like this, you don't have to recreate a will. There are cities all around the nation now touting the benefits of the real program of the National League of Cities. Fernando, you'll recall Councilwoman Zeta and I wanted the city of Fort Worth to bring the redlining tool. And so there are, there are so many tangible tools and exhibits and workshops that people of all races need to see and when, when I did the redlining tour in some city, my response was, oh, I'm not crazy. Redlining was put in by the federal government. And so education is so very important. I'm sure people are, are learning the importance of Tulsa, Oklahoma, Black Wall Street. Not all Black folk even knew about that. But when you hear the saying, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, well, hell, what if your bootstraps were taken in a mob that wiped out your entire Black community because of the wealth? And so there's much to be stated and shared in the benefit of education. And I think when we are all open to being educated with truth, not fake news, then we're all make the better for it. That's well stated. Thank you, Ms. Simmons. We're gonna let we're gonna let Bob Ray have the last word. Bob Ray Sanders. Bob Ray, you need to Wait. unmute yourself, sir. Oh, there you okay. go. Um when, when we got together for the first time, uh, the four co-chairs, and we had to come up with the number of people that we were going to add to this task force and how diverse it was going to be. Uh, and, we, and we didn't want it too large because we wanted to get work done. So we came up with adding 19 more people to make it a total of 23 people. Uh, and, and I thought we did a good job. It was seven blacks, seven whites, seven Hispanics, uh, one Asian American, one Iranian American, uh, two people who self-identified as LGBT. So, I mean, for a city the size of Fort Worth, that was a pretty representative group. But in terms of other diversity, we we got a couple of people on that uh, task force who were down at City Hall calling the mayor names every Tuesday night, <laughs> jumping on the city council. So we included those people in the process. Now, for me, yes, I was one who was concerned that, wait a minute, the council, members of the council, and use the police association as one group. Most of the council was supported by the police association. I, I have my own doubts. I mean, how much would they listen to us about changes in the police department if they were going to be listening to the police association disagreeing with everything we recommended? That was that. That's just me. You know, I, that's the way I thought. As it turned out, you know, we communicated well. Uh, the mayor communicated well with us. Other members of the council community, community communicated well, as did the uh, the uh, city manager. So we got together. We, you know, I, I can and, and as Rabbi alluded to a minute ago, we talked to the police chief on more than one occasion, trying to get him to understand some things that, at that time, he just didn't understand. At least in my opinion. But we worked through all of that, and we still came up with a report that we were able to present to the council with the backing of the city manager. And we're progressing on many of those issues. And we set a, a, a process in, in motion that those things will be monitored and reported back to the council and, and the city as a whole every three months or every six months. So it's not over. We're still in this. As you see, we're still here. And our, our job was supposedly ended, what, three years ago? <laughs> or three years ago. But we're still here. Yeah. Fernando, why didn't you mention defund the police, that chant? Mm -hmm. I guess that's another topic. That's that's another, that's that's another, another that will topic. be the next workshop, Councilmember Bivens. So. <laughs> Fort, Fort Worth has already been operating that way. And it's just so much misinformation. 
I just want to. I just want to thank every one of you for being a part of this workshop. I think that, um, well, first of all, based on the numbers, I think so far this is the most popular and well-attended workshops of the conference. Um, mostly, I would assume it's because of the honest conversation. If there's one thing that um, this task force is known as, it's being is sharing their opinion and being open and listening to others. And so I really appreciate the honest conversation. Sometimes it's not easy to hear or to even be a part of conversations. And, and I think that it is just extremely important that we continue to have them. So thank you so much. Thank you for being a part of the conference, for being a part of this workshop. And just to everyone else who is moving on to the next workshop, if you look up in the left-hand corner, it says back to lobby. Click on that and then you can pick your next workshop and make sure you join as a viewer. So thank you all. You have 15 minutes until the next workshop begins. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks. for inviting me. I had fun. Thank you. I'm glad that you guys were here. Really appreciate it. Rep, I, I asked Louise about you. She told me you were cool. 